Hi everybody, I'm Adam Del Monte and welcome to this week's video blog. Today, I want to show you an exercise to help strengthen your left hand. So, let's just dive right into it and then we'll break it down. So you start slow and you build up the speed. So let's talk about the left hand a little bit more in general and then specifically how can we make the most of this particular exercise. So as most of you know me, I do not play uh, classical in this position, in the typical classical position. Uh, I play both flamenco and classical in this position uh, with my guitar leaning on the right leg and uh, I won't get into it in this video as to the different seating positions and why I chose this one. That's a whole other subject. Um, but I will say this much. Uh, the classical position gives us this very ideal uh, position for the left hand especially where it's very natural for the guitar to approach this fingerboard in a perpendicular way, in a square way, straight on like this, as opposed to in a slant. Um, so it's easier for the left hand to be in this, you know, textbook position uh, than when you're in this position. But I try and keep some of the qualities of that position in my left hand uh, when I'm playing both flamenco and classical in, in my normal, my usual position. Um, so, for example, uh, there are moments where it is more advantageous and more relaxing to be in a position where the left hand approaches the string at a bit of an angle, sort of a little bit of a diagonal angle. Now, there is an issue with that because when you're in this angle, um, the, the rest of your fingers kind of, they're, if they're going to stay aligned and if they're like this, then all of a sudden the pinky is naturally further away from the fingerboard. So not only is he the shortest guy, top of it he lives the furthest away so he has to travel faster and, and, a, and a longer distance to land on the string so that is and it can be an issue if you don't have a lot of speed okay um, on the other hand when you're approaching the guitar from a square perspective very perpendicular to the fingerboard what that does it makes the skyline so to speak of the fingers much more even. And so the distances between the fingers and the strings is practically even and the same, which basically means that the, the, the travel time of every finger to every note is similar and therefore much more uh, easier to coordinate with the right hand. That's the theory. In reality, I, I, I don't want to mention names here or anything like that, but I have seen guitarists of all styles, flamenco, jazz, classical, you name it, that on the outside, um, their position is not textbook, but they deliver perfectly. I've seen guitarists that, that move their hands in ways that are, that are not exactly pleasing, but you cannot argue with the results. So that brings me to another sort of idea that I have and a theory that I have in terms of how, how the mechanics work and that is a subject for a different video. I won't even touch upon it today. But nonetheless, it is a very significant phenomena, I believe, in how you know, playing an instrument eventually happens and, and how it varies from person to person. From body type, from anatomy type, whether, you're, you, know, whether you have strong arms, or very or skinny arms and skinny fingers and more flexibility, less flexibility. All those factors they all come into play ultimately when you you know which position is best for you and and how much percentage of each position do you use? Because I mean I've even seen people who play mostly square. All of a sudden you'll catch them do this because it just makes sense. Okay. Um, however, the purpose of today's exercise is to. Uh, 
work with discipline and with an in depth to strengthen the, 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 the hands and the fingers in, in, the, in the sort of ideal way, right? You have training and then you have the real game out there. And then hopefully most of your training will kick in the actual live game. But in the live game, there's always a variable that you're not going to take into account when you're training, whether it's sports or whether it's war. I don't like to use it, the analogy of war, but it's still a, it's it's a pra for practical purposes. You know, you can do training exercises and then in war, all of a sudden, I don't know, aliens come and they kill everybody. So what are you going to do? All your training goes out the, out the window. Anyway, let's hope those aliens don't come anytime soon. Um, so to train in the ideal way, right, uh, and in hopes that this training will uh, will kick in in reality, uh, you want to work in the most intense, focused and by the book to be a real stickler with every detail of the exercise. And ultimately, when you practice, of course, that's how you should be. When you play, when you perform, you want to just forget about everything and you just want to go and be in the flow. It's that's a whole again. It's a different subject. We'll talk about that. How do you transition from uh, from the exercise mode into performance mode? Another video. But let's get back to our exercise. So here we have um, we're working on hammer-ons and pull-offs, which is ideal for strengthening the left hand. So hammer-ons are pretty straightforward. You just you play one note. Doesn't matter if it's an open string or from one. That's a hammer on. Pull off is a little harder. Right? I've seen many people, many students, uh, and even guitarists, professional guitarists, not pull off, like really pull off. A lot of people sometimes go, they'll just, they'll just kind of lift their finger and hope for the best. As you can see, that doesn't have much power in the pull off. So you have, so the hammer on is strong and the pull off is very weak. So for the pull off to be as strong as the hammer on, the way to do it, there's two things you need to do. Pull down onto the fingerboard but also feel the landing on the string below and, and then release. So there's kind of three little phases that happen instantly, right? You hammer on, okay, that's the easy part. Pull off, down onto the string, feel here, right, right underneath at this part of the flesh, feel the contact with the string below, with the G string in this case, and then release. So make sure that in this protocol, you feel those three elements happening in the right order. Again, this is a programming that needs to take place separate from performing and playing and having fun with the guitar. This is, you know, serious work. So you want to feel the order, the right order of everything happening correctly and beautifully. You want to enjoy it every bit of the of the process pull off onto the fingerboard i'm feeling the fingertip here feels the fingerboard and the the the, the bottom part of my thing of my pinky of this like the middle of the joint of the tip joint feels the leaning on the third string and then release so before you even attempt the exercise just take a moment and try and just feel this three uh, three uh, pronged process. Okay, now two little tricks to help relax. I remember once I saw a teacher say, relax your hand and the student didn't know what what the teacher wanted. And so I thought long and hard about, okay, relax your hand. It's just easy to say, relax your hand. And how do you relax? Uh, without taking Valium. So, the way to relax, two things. Number one, play very slowly. And number two, equally as important, play very softly, very quietly. And if you do those two things, it's 
practically impossible to be tense. So remember, slow and like really quiet. And when I say quiet, I mean, imagine for a second that you're stuck in a trailer in the middle of winter in Siberia. You're fr and you're sharing a room with somebody and they want to sleep and you want to practice. They're sleeping, you don't want to wake them up. You want to practice, but you can't go outside because it's 45 below zero. So what do you do? You practice like this. You're really trying not to wake up your friend. That is soft. So when you get into this mindset, immediately you realize that you don't need all this muscle, all this effort, all this tension. You just need a teeny bit enough to not fall off your chair. Just super relaxed. Induce yourself into this relaxed state. Another trick that you can do to help relax. And I'll do another video that goes much more in depth of how to relax and the meditation and so on. But again, just a quick fix is just imagine, trying to remember when was the last time you were really, really tired. And you're driving in the middle of the afternoon west, the sun is setting and you're falling asleep in the car. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you know what I mean. When you're like really, really tired, just trying to remember, feel the tired and soft and slow before you know it. You're very, very relaxed. Okay, let's move on. So, this is the practice mode you want to be in when you're programming. And by the way, this is also another thing. The word practice doesn't really define the true process for me. I personally have already long ago replaced the word practice with the word program. Because I think it's more pro appropriate and I believe that language matters. We say practice is just kind of this re repetitive thing that you're doing and then you, you hope it sticks. But thanks to, you know, computers and the comp language associated with, with computers, uh, I think it gives us a more accurate um, analogy and image as to what ideally should take place in your body. So for me, this is programming. So how do you program uh, the right relaxation, the right motion, and the right release into this exercise and ultimately into your entire technique. So you want to program, and I'm going to use that word a lot, you want to program relaxation, effortlessness, and the right position. Of course, the right position is, whether it's a little slanted or totally square, round fingers. That's for sure. Round fingers, and you want to make sure that the fingertips are also nice and curled so you can find the power and the leverage that it offers, right? The arch of the fingers offer that ideal strength and leverage in the power of your hand. So you want to have all this power in your hand, but you don't want to use it all. You want to use the least amount. So here we go. This is what goes on in my mind when I'm practicing something like that and trying to acquire the qualities that we're talking about. So I'm gonna play and talk at the same time and hopefully you can sort of catch the ideas on the fly. Breathe. Feel the weight of the arm on the string. Imagine that your fingertips are like monkey tails. You're thinking, what? Monkey tails? What are you talking about? Next time you get a chance, see if you can see a monkey wrap his tail around a branch and he's moving around and guess what? His, all his limbs are loose and free to move around. So he has this one point of pivot, an anchor, which is the tip of his, which is his tail, and everything else is loose as a result of that. So again, images. Imagine that your fingertip is the tail of a monkey and here are the rest of the, rest of the, uh, rest of your limbs, if you will, and you want to feel that relaxation from not squeezing, because that will definitely bring in a lot of tension into your playing. But rather, you want to f activate from the tip of the finger the power of the finger, but, but fr from the arm as well. So, imagine you're, you're hanging here and 
very relaxed. Now, softly, as softly as you can. So first find that point of the least effort and some result. Just practice that first. At your pace. This is a pace that's comfortable for me. And mindfully pay attention to how does, it, how does your muscle and your pinky feel pulling off and releasing. Make sure you f that release registers, like I said before. Make sure it registers and, and notice the, the, the change in the muscle. It flexes, it releases, it flexes, it releases. And then ask yourself, how much less effort can I do to get the same result or a similar result? The main thing is to program the position. This position, this ideal position, you want to program it in such a way that it becomes second nature. And again, that won't happen overnight. You have to do it every day or, you know, have a phase where you say, for the next six weeks, that's going to be my main focus. That's a good strategy. So, moving on. So that's one sensation that you want to become familiar with. Now, main thing here is to make sure that the other two fingers that are not involved in this action right now move the least possible. It's impossible that they don't move at all. Maybe some people can do it. There's always going to be some reaction, some something, but you want to bring that down to a minimum. That is the exercise. That is the goal of the exercise. And you do that by relaxing and sending these messages from your mind, from your will, right? The boss is here. You're sending these instructions to your fingers, imposing, I don't like to use the imposing your will, but yeah, you're imposing your will. Let's call it what it is. It's not a democracy here. Just kidding. Um, you wanna, so you wanna impose your will. You wanna program, in other words, yeah, impose the will is a little aggressive sounding. You wanna program the sensation <laughs> All right, because language matters. You want to program the feeling of the fingers are as inactive as possible whenever they're not needed. That is the purpose of this exercise. The fingers that are not in play barely move or barely even break a sweat. Just as passive as possible. Now, it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to to do that with absolutely nothing, because we're human, we're not robots, right? There's a little bit of something going on here, but that's the whole point of the exercise, to try and cultivate that, that super awareness of what's going on inside your hand. So, everything I just said, carry it on to the next part. Right? And every combination of fingers is gonna pose a different challenge to different fingers. phrase that's a little different that creates sort of this circular kind of thing where it brings us back to the beginning okay let me break that down for you again two and four one and two one and three three and four one and three Zero and one, one and three, zero and one, two and four, one and three, two and four, one and two. Here it's basically almost finished, and then we have this special phrase that's different, and it goes like this A, two hammer ons. Then we have the open D, and then we have a, a hammer-on from nowhere. In other words, usually hammer-ons, you're playing the same string and then you're hammering on because you have vibration here, and then you can, there's energy there for you to, it's easier to generate a sound like this than like this. Out of nowhere, you have to use a little bit more 
strength. So we have perfect opportunity to work this muscle. So right after that, you have three hammer-ons in a row on the fourth string. And back to shift, and we're going again in a loop. pace and uh, the main focus again is to keep the fingers straight in place not moving excessively and to keep them calm and controlled and just moving elegantly all right on the right hand I was doing everything with a thumb and uh, the thumb as far as flamenco goes there's basically two positions for it one is very much like the classical position, where as you can see, my thumb is at a 45 degree angle approaching the string. And, um, and you, you kind of find your, find the nick right under, like the pocket, right underneath, between the string, the nail and the flesh, and you just play one note. Beautiful. Now, if you're just playing one note with, uh, like as part of an arpeggio, for example, note I have plenty of time to prepare a single note with this position without it sounding ugly however if I'm playing uh, repeated notes with a thumb then I would rather use this position which is more of a almost 90 degree angle to uh, to the string, meaning that you're using a much wider surface of the nail, and that gives a much more solid sound and much more presence. However, little disclaimer here, this position is definitely not natural. Uh, it took me a while to get used to this position, and even then I can't do it for like a super long time because it puts a bit of strain on, on your tendons here. And, uh, and I only use that, this position sparingly, like if I have a, a quick lick, you know. So as you can see, I kind of moved around from here to here because I don't need this kind of sound when I'm playing with an arpeggio because it puts the hand in a very awkward position and it it doesn't I mean it, it sounds good it sounds fine but it's not necessary so it's overkill so uh, I chose to use this particular thumb position to kind of work on two things at once um, once you've worked on the thumb by itself and I'll do a video on the thumb in a separate occasion but just for now you know a little bit about the uh, about the theory of it okay so when you use the thumb in this way you're going to get a much thicker sound a much more solid sound um, but again the main part of this exercise is of course the left hand Thank you for being here today, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Join me on Patreon if you would like to. Uh, today, by the way, I'm playing my Altamira N700. It's a great flamenco guitar, very, very budget conscious. And uh, if you have any curiosity or interested in this guitar, please shoot me a, a, an email or, or a message, and I will gladly tell you and answer any questions about this guitar. I think it's a great guitar. In fact, I... Uh, I toured last year in China and in Texas with this guitar, and it has a very, very flamenco sound. It's a negra, as you can see. 
and um, you know it's uh, it just has this macho aggressive flamenco sound which you expect from a really much more expensive flamenco guitar than what this is and it's extremely balanced and and very powerful so stay healthy until the next one i hope you enjoyed this video and uh until then stay safe and wash your hands especially under your